Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Penny Reed with eAssist Dental Solutions. We're excited to have you with us today. I'll go ahead and uh, as everyone rolls in here, which more than likely this is your lunch hour, uh, we're excited that you're spending it with us and looking forward to getting started in a few moments. This has to be one of my most exciting things that I get to talk about uh, is how to drive growth in the practice, uh, especially some uh, short-term focus methods here in the fourth quarter to help uh, push us beyond maybe even what our goals were for the year. So uh, welcome, happy to have you with us. And uh, as you're joining in, um, go ahead and highlight a little bit about today's topic. So fourth quarter push, if you want, uh, you can think of the business year or I like sports analogies. Maybe you're thinking about the fourth quarter in a ball game, right? Maybe things are just right down to the wire and you need that little extra uh, to help you score the points and, and hit your targets. So uh, we're going to talk about that today. A little bit about me. Um, many of you may know me, probably more of you don't know me than know me. Um, currently, I'm the Chief Growth Officer for eAssist Dental Solutions, the nation's largest outsourced dental billing company. And prior to that, I was a, for uh, about 30 years, a practice management coach and uh, dental speaker still have the opportunity to speak uh, around the country and to do meetings like today. So uh, this tells a little bit about me, but what I'll say is just like Cinderella uh, got to put on the fancy dress and hop in the pumpkin that was turned into a carriage and, and go to the ball. That's kind of what I'm doing today because I'm uh, primarily putting on the practice management hat to share some exciting ideas with you here that you can take back and hopefully begin implementing this afternoon or tomorrow. But a little bit about eAssist, uh, which is who's sponsoring the webinar today. Uh, we invented optimized revenue cycle management and front office services for dentists. So there's a lot of other companies out there uh, that do what we do. We feel like uh, we're if we're not the best, we're definitely one of them. Uh, we currently serve over 2,900 dental practices and have posted $15 billion to date uh, in clients' practice management systems uh, payments that have come from the insurance company. So uh, we're really excited about the peace of mind that we bring to offices. And other things, um, we have a lot of accolades that we're super proud of. Uh, Inc. 5000, we're the endorsed dental billing solution for ADOM, uh, the American Association of Dental Office Managers. Great, great group. Uh, we're on industry board members with Women in DSO. Um, super connected and very excited to present this message today. So let's get down to business uh, because I've got some, uh, hopefully some pearls that maybe you haven't heard of before, or maybe you have, and in the busyness of the office, they've kind of slipped to the back burner. So since we're in the fourth quarter, which I don't know where this year went. Um, I don't know how many of you feel the same way. I personally had a move that took place. Uh, we changed benefits. Uh, my family, this was not the year for, uh, well, actually it was the year, depending on whether you're the patient or the dentist, uh, for different members of my family to have dental work done. So I am the only person in my family that has not maxed out their dental benefits. And we all know how busy life is and that our patients should know, and some of them are aware, uh, that their benefits do expire every year. I would say 95% or greater of dental benefit plans do expire. They don't roll over. There are always those exceptions out there. And for the most part, most of those plans roll over at the calendar year. So, you know, while we may think that a lot of patients will be reaching out to say, hey, I want to schedule, they need reminders that their benefits are expiring. And, and I love the word expiring because I don't know about you, if I have a coupon um, or a voucher that I've gotten, maybe it's dollars from the gap uh, or something else that's going to expire, a restaurant certificate, I will put that on the refrigerator because I don't know about you, I don't like to lose money. Like I, I want to be able to redeem whatever that coupon is. And, and while in an ideal world, uh, we don't want patients to be too insurance dependent for sure. Dental insurance is what drives a lot of patients to come in, right? Uh, you know, their perception may be 
and and please don't say this, but I'm going to use the little air quotes, come in twice a year for my free cleaning. We don't want to say that. Yet for some of them, that's their perception. So if you haven't already done this, and I would say even if you have, marketing messages take seven times to be seen. So maybe you don't present the message the same way over and over. Yet if you have not done an email uh, broadcast with your uh, patient relation management system, I would do that. Uh, let them know that you know their benefits may, for the year may be expiring and to please reach out. I would do that with social media messages. Um, I would also put that on your uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram pages. And then I really want to dovetail this into an activity that I hope is a part ongoing part of things in your practice, yet can really be something when we think about hitting a gas pedal on a vehicle that we can turn off and on. So number one thing that I want to be sure that you jot down, or if you're uh, going to share this recording afterward when you get it with members of the team, please be sure that you make action items for the things that resonate for you, especially if there are items that you haven't uh, actually done yet. So get that message out to your patients that have dental benefits um, in general, right? That their benefits may be expiring. The next part of this would be something that's a little bit more detailed and it is to make treatment reactivation calls. Now you may also want to make hygiene reactivation calls. Um, and I have calls, we're going to use that term loosely because you'll see three different icons that represent three different things. So back in the day, and for those of you that have attended sessions with me before, you know, I like to tell stories about the good old days. Although many of the things from years ago were not necessarily that grand, uh, they were in many ways a whole lot harder. So in the past, that was the only way that we had to reach patients was snail mail. And you, by all means, could also mail a letter if you wanted to, letting uh, patients know that they have benefits expiring. So tr the treatment reactivation calls are not only for insurance, but because that's what we talked about on the last slide, let's start with that part. Um, every practice management software has the ability to run a listing of patients who have dental benefits. And you can even outline or segment out the ones that have not used them all. So that's a great, what I would call, uh, if you were in sales, hot list, hot leads uh, of those patients that you want to reach out to. Now, if you really want to narrow it down, and I would, uh, because if you're like many other practices out there, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, you may be shorter than you'd like to be on being effectively staffed, on having a full team. So I would look to see not only uh, who has benefits remaining, but I would also look at who's been in in the last 18 to 24 months that has benefits remaining so that we can not only send a general message uh, in a, and create a list and not necessarily specify what the dollars are, but to let them know, you know, hey, it appears you do have benefits remaining. And we would love to, you know, get, get you in while we still have appointment availability uh, for your hygiene visit and any necessary treatment so that you can maximize the benefits available to you. Um, and, and I want to press the pause button for a moment on the actual outreaches and say, if most of our patients, and I, I heard this from a colleague of mine uh, when we were out presenting a few weeks ago, uh, that's with one of our sister companies, Unitas PPO Solutions, and said, you know, in theory, if every patient maxed out their benefits every year, on average, you know, uh, other than the neglect, that maximum that has not increased in decades would probably cover most patients' dental needs. Yet we all know that that's not what happens, right? We diagnose things, patients don't necessarily do them in that calendar year, and they're paying for benefits that they're not using. So we want to market to them and encourage them for the ones that have the dental benefit plan to take advantage of that. So, um, so that being said, whether it's calls, text messages, or emails, we want to have a strategic plan uh, to reach out to those patients. So it's hard to believe it's almost Thanksgiving. And when you factor out the few days around Thanksgiving break up until Christmas, we really only have about, depending on how many days a week you're open, you know, let's just say 20 to 25 business days 
uh, you know, focus business days before kids get out of school, which that can also be a great push. So, but, but even though it's probably closer to 30, let's call it 25. So if we were to, what we would say, chunk that down um, and look at how much availability do we actually have to get these patients in? And then also, could we form a task force, so to speak? So let's say uh, that we don't ha currently have enough administrative team members to help us with something like this. Is there someone who's worked with us before? Maybe it was a dental assistant, maybe it was an admin person that we could have come in a couple of days a week, a uh, couple of afternoons a week, or perhaps even work remotely to help us with this. So um, as far as getting specific, this would be where I would reach out and I would start with the patients that have been in more recently than the ones that it has been 18 plus months since they've been in uh, and go through that list uh, in your system of the patients that have benefits remaining first that uh, have treatment that needs to be done. And I would start with the larger treatment amounts uh, because it's easier for you to add more to the schedule in between now and then. So I would utilize uh, and also whatever the patient's preference may be that they have in their system, but I would utilize the phone text messaging, and emails. Uh, everyone has different preferences. I'll go ahead and tell you, I prefer text messages. I know I'm older than that category of uh, the generation. I should prefer a phone call. Most of the time I prefer a text because it doesn't require me to stop everything I'm doing. I can glance at it. Uh, the other thing that I would suggest is utilize uh, your patient relationship management systems. And I'm going to, there's a lot of great ones out there. I'll use Lighthouse as an example. Once you make these outreaches and you may have some patients that say, oh yes, I would like to come. And maybe you don't quite have as much appointment availability. And we'll talk about that um, in a few moments as you wish you did. Make yourself a, a quick call list. Uh, maybe you can do a quick fill uh, as one of your software options. Lighthouse 360, and, and I know the name of this one, uh, has a feature called Fill It Fast. And so if you have an appointment opening, you can specify what you're looking for, operative or hygiene, and it will give you 10 names of patients that you might want to get in. So that's another great way for you to utilize and begin to uh, get patients in because we all know in most practices what happens, it's the last week before the end of the year. And that's when everybody wants to come in, right? That is when they realize that their benefits are expiring because they wake up and they go, oh my goodness, it's only, you know, seven days until Christmas or, you know, tomorrow's Christmas and I need to get in before the 31st. So I would make a plan uh, for finding out who has benefits remaining, start with that list. Then I would move on to patients even the ones that don't have insurance that have had a diagnosis within the last six months because patients that are recently diagnosed are more likely to go ahead and schedule. And I would, you know, go through those, be sure you're notating that in your office journal and the system so that you don't have the same patient contacted by, you know, three different people in the office. And you may even in dividing and conquering want to split those lists up alphabetically. So be sure that you're making not only treatment reactivation calls, but also hygiene reactivation calls for any openings that you may have in the hygiene department. And if you don't have any openings, as I mentioned, we'll get to that in a moment. So that would be a huge action step uh, in addition to reaching out to those patients that have benefits expiring. And again, I think the words, the word expiring is super powerful. So I would use that as well. Uh, the next would be same-day service. And again, going back to what I won't necessarily call the good old days, but the old days, which just means I'm old. Um, we sometimes did things same day. It was usually patient generated or patient requested. Uh, we It's not that we didn't have huddles. We did. Uh, we didn't have the technology that offices have today. So it was more of the flipping through the charts, pulling out the treatment plans which were on a blue sheet uh, and looking to see who was coming in that had treatment outstanding. So I think most of us know and are aware, you know, we can look at the schedule even the day before to see what's open tomorrow, who's coming in and who might want to go ahead and take advantage of while they're in the office, going ahead and getting that treatment done, which is also 
a great thing for the team to focus on as far as who has benefits remaining. It's definitely not too uh, early now to begin to have those conversations that the appointment availability is shrinking every day in between now and the end of the year. So for that same day service, if we're not doing this already, I would look at uh, your patients in hygiene that have operative outstanding. I would also look at your patients coming in for operative that may be past their recommended recare sequence. And I would look for first the obvious, right? What openings do we currently see? And then I would take a second look and sort of ask, okay, if we did want to or need to make room for a crown or maybe even two crowns or a couple of fillings or one or two hygiene patients, if, if there were a way for us to do that and still take great care of the patients that were already on the schedule, where are some places that we might be able to do that, right? So you could almost kind of make a game out of it. Um, to see where might we be able to do that for today and also for tomorrow. And then the other is, if we're not already doing it, for those procedures where a patient might be able to stay is to ask them. Even if, if this is something that has been treatment planned in the past, uh, I, one of my dear friends who's a, a dental consultant and also a, a speaker, Deborah Englehart Nash, she talks about in the hygiene visit that one of the first things that she recommends is going ahead and having the conversation with the patient after we find out how they're doing and let them know that it's great to see them and reestablish that rapport is to pull up the prior treatment plan and say, hey, let's let's take a look at you know what the doctor has diagnosed previously. And, you know, let's be sure and speak to that as we look at your radiographs and any images and I'm curious, what may have prevented you from moving forward with that treatment? Often they may say they just forgot, or maybe they could have misinterpreted. And this would also be one of these key phrases that I would write down that maybe we don't want to do uh, or don't want to say because patients will say, well, when, you know, when should I do this? And the doctor may say, well, well, you don't have to do that today meaning you don't have to do that today, not that it shouldn't be done in the near future. So I think clarity is power and being sure, uh, you know, so, oh, well, you know, I didn't really realize that it was that urgent. Well, that may be something to uh, bring up when the doctor comes in to say, you know, Penny's here. We've talked about the crown that you diagnosed on the upper left. And I asked what may have been preventing her from doing that. And she just mentioned that she didn't think it was that urgent. Well, we all know it's certainly not going to get better if the patient doesn't take care of it. So looking for those opportunities, um, again, who's coming into hygiene that has operative outstanding, who's coming into operative that could use a hygiene visit. So um, I love to get super focused and I'm seeing here that my word, I know you can fill in the blank of what was left with operative there, but I think my mouse might've slipped on me when I was scooting that uh, over and I think, okay, how could we be $1,000 per day smarter? And I'm going to say that in this particular practice, this would be one doctor and maybe two hygienists, right? How could we be $1,000 per day smarter for one doctor and two hygienists? So if we had two doctors and four hygienists, then that might be $2,000 a day smarter. And you guys may decide that, oh no, we want to make it $2,000 a day smarter per doctor. So uh, again, those same questions, who's coming in today with unscheduled operative treatment or hygiene needs. And then this, this, uh, these fees are from the ADA um, 2022 survey that was done. So these were probably 2021 fees. Talk about fees coming up in just a moment. Um, what could contribute another $1,000 a day? Well, maybe it's a crown. Maybe it's two posterior composites inoperative and two recare patients. And I put a half of a bite wing fee because maybe one patient needed bite wings and the others didn't. So, uh, you know, that could be a crown. That could be the combo of, of two posterior, two surface composites and two hygiene visits. But I think, and you could even, you know, make a game around it to say, hey, if we hit this, uh, then, you know, we'll have a gift card drawing, you know, or we'll, we'll if we hit this so many days, out of the month, we'll have a pizza party, you know, do something to help incentivize the team. Um, and if they already have a team bonus plan in place, 
the more you uh, collect, the more you produce and collect, the more that they uh, would benefit from that. So be specific. And this would also be something to write down. If we simply say, well, let's look for work that we could work in today that wasn't already on the schedule. That's not as powerful as let's add what, you know, what's already scheduled for today. All right. Maybe it's 6,000 or maybe it's 8,000. All right. Well, if we were going to be a thousand dollars smarter today, if 8,000 was scheduled, then we would see, is it possible or doable without sacrifice, sacrificing patient care or the patient experience for us to add that other amount, right? Because again, we're, we're looking at fourth quarter push here, um, especially if we might not have hit our revenue targets. So $1,000 a day smarter or whatever number that you may want to fill in. All right, so uh, scheduling is definitely, this adding the $1,000 per day, definitely impacted by scheduling. So uh, there are a lot of different ways to schedule in the dental practice. I didn't realize that some of them were better than others. So when I was first taught about um, goals in the practice and, you know, really just kind of getting my feet wet on terminology and what have you many, many years ago, they gave me a dollar goal that should be scheduled every day in order for us to have a healthy day on the doctor's book, right? So that we could, uh, you know, keep the utilities on and pay the team and be sure that there was you know, something left over for the dentist. Well, I was all over it. Um, and what I didn't realize was that there were certain procedures that took place in only in operative and certain procedures that only took place in hygiene. So I had scheduled a day, the next day to go and I was so excited. I had three, this was before we expanded to five chairs. So this was many, many years ago. We had three chairs, two hygiene and one doctor chair. I had three root canals scheduled at 8 a.m., uh, the hygienists were not very happy with me. So anyway, I, I wound up moving uh, two of those and and very quickly learned um, from the team, from the clinical team, what could go where. So if we're not already pre-blocking for uh, high production, then that is something that I would suggest that you do. And this here, here's what this does mean. Being sure that there's some time reserved on the schedule for those high value appointments. For some offices, you may say, okay, well, we want the whole day templated. And if that works for you, that's awesome. Others may say, oh, we absolutely pre-block and we only do crown and bridge, you know, at 8 a.m., at 9.30 a.m., and at 10.30 a.m. And, you know, if that works great for you, that's awesome. It's less about when it is and more about the fact that we actually have those times. So, I'll give an analogy. If we were in an auto repair shop and let's say we did oil changes and windshield wiper blade refills and uh, we did tire alignments, we sold tires, we also replaced transmissions and engines. So if we're super popular, we might be back to back slammed with oil changes and tire rotations, which it's great to have customers, right? And to see them often Yet it's the bigger procedures that are the ones that really allow us to stay in business and thrive. So we want to be sure that we're saving some space, um, at least up until the day before or two days out for those higher production appointments. And if we are, that's where those same day conversions or the same day additions can really come into play if we don't feel like we just have to have the schedule super full of everything. So um, when we are finding those higher production appointments and we're wanting to direct, you know, we're either directing the patients about where we want them to schedule or they're directing us about when they will come, right? And there's always a little bit of that balance there. But we, for the most part, this is our, our show, our Broadway production. There's no business like Smile Business. And we want to direct the audience on, when to laugh and when to clap and and when to schedule for their appointments. So um, we want to ask the questions that give choices. So here, there's one up here now. Oh, wow. Well, we have Tuesday at 10 or Thursday at 2. Which works better for you? So that's a really good question. An even better question, if we have openings today or tomorrow, is to say, oh, hey, uh, Melanie, it looks like we 
could do that crown today if you were able to stay, or we also have an opening at 10 a.m. tomorrow. Or maybe you have two different options where you could do it today. So I would think in, in our minds, and I would write this down, you know, to go over for the team, just a reminder of when is the first available that we can offer a patient, especially if it's high production. Now, the other thing that I would say is if you've got a patient there and it's a filling and we can go ahead and do that filling today while they're there, you know, let's offer that too. So this is not only about the higher production procedures because it all adds up and it all counts. Um, so definitely be sure that we're pre-blocking for uh, high production so that we've got balanced days. And especially between now and the end of the year, we're accommodating the patients that have dental benefits as well. So it's a win-win for them. All right, let's talk about capacity. And if you haven't learned already with me, I love analogies. Um, so let's take ourselves mentally to the grocery store. And let's think about something that I haven't eaten in years, peanut butter, Captain Crunch. Yeah, at the end, when we do the Q&A, you can tell me if you also are a peanut butter Captain Crunch lover. Um, it made the roof of my mouth sore, but I'm telling you, there's no, that's probably what got me through college was peanut butter Captain Crunch. So from a capacity standpoint, we would look at uh, this as an inventory, right? So let's think about capacity and translate that into inventory. So if we had a grocery store and we had a goal to sell 200 boxes of peanut butter Captain Crunch a month, how many boxes would we have to have on the shelf in order to sell 200? Well, it would be at least 200, right? So, and ideally we would wanna have a little bit more inventory than what we were expecting to sell. So it's the same way with capacity. And I realized from talking to different offices around the country, some offices are crushing it and their, uh, their hygiene chairs are full and they may even be having uh, difficulty in finding hygienists to, they love to offer more appointments. So what I would do is I would look at, first thing I would do is look at what is your current capacity for appointments in between now and the end of the year for two things. One is in the hygiene department for recare visits, periodontal treatment. This would be if you're a general practice um, and also new patients. And depending on the practice type and the doctor's philosophy and preference, maybe the new patients are being seen and operative first. And that's okay, right? So I would look at that inventory as well. But here's, here's why I'm focusing in. We talked about operative treatment and pre-blocking. The main reason why I want to focus in on this capacity piece first with new patients and hygiene is if you think about a practice as a vehicle, there are two gas pedals, right? You know, most vehicles have a gas pedal and the brakes. Well, the dental practice has two gas pedals. One is new patients and the other is the hygiene department. And the reason for that is this, this is where, other than your emergency patients, where most of your diagnosis takes place, right? New patient visits, regardless of which department they're seen in and hygiene appointments the more of those diagnostic opportunities that you have, the more production opportunities that you have, and then the better your uh, case presentation, your treatment presentation and acceptance is, there, the more work that there is, the more inventory that there is to put on the books. So many practices, most practices have plenty of inventory. They just may not have the actual capacity to get the patients in for them. So Number one is I would look at what are the total number of new patient um, slots that you have in between now and the end of the year. And then of those, how many of those are available? And then the third thing that I would look at for the new patients is if there were a way to create more new patient opportunities, that is if we're currently, if, if, we, if we have the wonderful problem of it being three months before we can get a new patient in, then we have a capacity issue. And so that would be where I would begin to, you know, take it to the next team meeting or take it to the next management meeting to say, okay, if there were a way for us to create more availability for new patient appointments, even if it was short term, how could we do that? Uh, and so that I would look at that. 
The other area to look at is how many hygiene uh, perio appointments as well as recare appointments are available in between now and the end of the year. And let's say that we are on a, at least on a temporary basis, right? For the fourth quarter, able to staff some additional hygiene days, maybe they're hygienists that used to work for us and they're happy to come in and temp. Uh, most people are spending more money around the holidays, right? Re regardless of how they may celebrate the holidays and they're looking for a little bit of extra spending money. So even if you're adding, uh, maybe it's one or two days a week of hygiene temporarily to the schedule, as long as you're working to get those appointments filled, that can really be a great way to boost the fourth quarter. And you may even find that you're continuing to create that demand uh, into the next year. And, and hey, that great problem of growth uh, where you're always having patients ask, wow, I want to come in. Do I really have to wait that many weeks? So I would just pause, go in and see um, what your appointment availability is. Uh, when is the next available new patient appointment? It should be, and this would, I'm going to say for an emergency, hopefully it's in the next day or two uh, for a triage appointment, but for a new patient comprehensive evaluation, hopefully it's within the next week because that's usually patients are thinking, hey, I need to get in and get this done in the next week or maybe two. Same for the hygiene department. If they're calling to come in, they're hoping that they can come in in the next couple of weeks. So look at what your uh, availability is for that and see if there are some ways that you might be able to expand that capacity. Maybe it's coming in an hour earlier. Maybe it's uh, one or two days a week, or maybe it's, you know, staying an hour later, one or two days a week. The little, the little uh, shifts that you make can have a big impact, especially depending on the demand. So change your approach. This will be another point to patient financing. Um, I'm a big believer in this and have been since my first days in the dental office. And the thought process is, and I'll tell you one of the reasons why I'm a big believer. When I first started in dentistry, I was in my early to mid twenties. Like most early to mid 20 year olds, I didn't have a lot of money. Um, I really was just establishing my credit. I'd been out of college for a few years. I'd worked for Walmart. And so when, when I came into dentistry and saw the amount of what some of the treatment plans were, I was pretty shocked. Um, and I can remember, and I even remember talking to my doctor about this, that when I would sit down to talk to the patient, you know, make the financial arrangements about how they were going to pay for their treatment, that I would get a little nervous because I would think I don't have the money to do that. Um, and so here's what's great. There've never been more options than there are today uh, to assist patients in getting the care that they need. And let's look at retail, right? If you went into Lowe's um, and you were looking at washer and dryers, you wouldn't have someone in the appliance department say necessarily, I mean, they may, okay, well, what's your budget? Let's go look over here. More than likely, they're not saying that. They'll say, what are you looking for? And then they also have options for you uh, where you could do 12 months deferred interest. Or um, if we shift away from that retail example, there are many, and we'll just say, for example, care credit, where you can do longer term uh, payment options that have a fixed rate. And so for a lot of patients, they're not that they're not paying attention at all to the interest rate. What they really want to know is, can I afford whatever that payment is for whatever that term is? So if it's a hundred dollars a month and I pay that same amount every single month for three years or four years or five years, or maybe it's $200 a month, or maybe it's $400 a month, but changing our approach to say, let's let the patient decide, you know, how they want to pay for it. And, and granted, we have to be sure that they qualify, yet I would kind of set that part aside when we're looking at the treatment. And then we could even ask, the, you know, present the, the full amount confidently, dentistry's an investment. As I mentioned in my household uh, this year, we have invested a lot of money in dentistry this year. My, my husband was born... Um, with uh, congenitally missing 12 permanent teeth. 
And so he's over the last several years had his entire upper arch pretty much redone. Um, and as a matter of fact, for Christmas, he said this year he wants his six front teeth. He's currently in a partial while his uh, implants, everything heals up for him to have those placed. So I totally get it, right, from the the whole patient experience. But what what's a comfortable thing for their budget if there's treatment that they really want? So for for many patients, yes, the deferred interest is appealing. But the other is they want to have a way or make a way that they can actually get that done, which makes that question that we talked about earlier for your recare patients coming in and pulling up their treatment plan and saying, may I ask, right? We're asking very softly, very gently asking permission. Um, you know, what may be preventing you from proceeding with whatever that treatment, you know, that bridge on the upper left or that crown on tooth number 15. So changing our approach to it to where we're, what we don't want to have happen is patients leave without that next appointment. Uh, that costs us more than what the additional interest may be that we may be paying if it's deferred interest for the fixed uh, payment plans on a lot of these arrangements, the patient's paying the interest. So we may not experience any more of a hit than we would if they were using a regular credit card. So um, changing that approach and being sure that when we're talking to patients about the recommended treatment, that we have all of the necessary items there to have that conversation. Uh, you know, we've got the x-rays pulled up, photos are even better. Uh, maybe they're the, the 3D scans that we have and, and really focusing on what it is that they want and then matching that up with uh, a preferred payment plan. And that payment plan may be for some patients and please don't use this term in front of them, um, but we can think about it this way in our mind. It may be a layaway. You know, if they say, well, you know, I'm not going to qualify for that, or, or maybe we find out that they didn't qualify for a payment plan that they applied for, is to say, you know, many of our patients that have been in a situation like yours, you know, we find an amount that they feel good about, that they can pay every month, or, or they may even start with a deposit, and we build up uh, that amount, you, you make monthly payments. And then when we get to these certain milestones, you come in and we, you know, do a prep, you know, or, or you know, maybe if it's implant treatment, you know, this first phase is $10,000, you know, well, what can, well, you know, I could do a thousand dollars a month. So we then determine, you know, at what point we can go ahead and get started with that. So their inability to qualify for something is different than their inability to pay and let's just be sure that they're prepaying if we're not using some sort of uh, outside finance company. So um, they could definitely prepay that and then phase the treatment um, as much as the treatment plan will allow. Okay, so if you are uh, in a practice that provides orthodontic treatment of some sort, or um, even better, clear aligners. You know, we all know Invisalign is the, the name brand. Um, I have a good friend that was a former client and is a practicing dentist that is teaching courses on how to make your own aligners with a 3D printer in your office. Whatever route you choose uh, to, to manufacture and deliver these, more and more patients are asking about the uh, clear uh, aligner trays. And while most of you, if you're doing this, a patient could schedule an appointment any day for that sort of consultation. Yet from a marketing standpoint, um, if we have a, a clear aligner day um, or an ortho day, it really draws the attention uh, to that particular product or service. And so here's how this would work, is you would look at your schedule and find a day and maybe you Maybe you also um, have limited treatment appointments that day and a full schedule of hygiene, right? But you announce, you, you mark the calendar and you say, hey, Friday, X date, we're having an ortho day. And whether you do a complimentary consultation for aligners or so much off of a consultation for uh, the orthodontic treatment, and maybe you say if they book it within, uh, if they put it on the schedule within two weeks, not that it has to occur within two weeks, uh, that they'll get X amount off their treatment. That can be a great way uh, to, you know, draw attention to it. Maybe there's 
uh, kids coming home from college, you know, unfortunately, maybe they didn't wear their retainers when they all went off to college. Um, that can be a great, not only Q4 push, but uh, something that you can do several times a year. But that could definitely, you know, if you just conservatively said $5,000 per uh, per case or, or per yes, you know, if you could get 10 of those in between now and the end of the year, that's another $50,000 potentially without having to add any additional uh, treatment days to the schedule. Um, again, you could market it on social media with your patient relationship system uh, in the office, you know, be looking every single day, just like you're looking for same day treatment. You could also add that question, who might be a candidate? You could offer, you know, for them to come on that day. Or if you have time, you could say, if you're interested, we could go ahead and do the same thing for you today and uh, do that consultation for clear aligners. So it's something great to market. Often, even if you have the little um, stands in every operatory that have the photo and it says, you know, we offer orthodontics or we offer this aligner system, many of your patients still don't realize that you offer that sort of treatment unless you've talked about it. So I would create that awareness and an ortho day can be another big way uh, to boost revenue in the fourth quarter. Have you ever wished, we're going to shift gears here, that you had a money tree? I have. Although every time the wind blew, I think I would be running outside like those people in the money booth, you know, just trying to gather up as much of it as I could. Um, so a lot of us do have a money tree and it's work that we've already done and it's sitting in our accounts receivable. So how much money are you waiting on? I don't know about you, Um I, if, if I have done work, I expect within a reasonable amount of time that I'm going to get paid for that. Yet when individuals have their own businesses, like a dental office, um, and all of the work has not been paid for up front, like you would do in a restaurant, right? Um, some of it's out to insurance. Some of it may be uh, estimated portion differences. Some Some of it may be with your financial policies in the office that you allow patients to make you another payment in 30 days. But I want you to write this down. How much money are we waiting on? And that can be a, a little takeaway for you to look at. Um, so if we think about the profitability funnel, and I'm going to come back to the how much money are we waiting on, there's a significant amount of time, energy, and money that is invested ongoingly in the practice to generate production, right? So we we pay for the team uh, members to be there. We're, we have marketing expenses. We're um, paying to have the phone answered. Maybe we even have after hours uh, service answering the phone for us. Or maybe we uh, have a group like Full Schedule uh, uh, that eAssist works with that we the individuals are calling the patients for you to put them on the schedule. So huge investment simply to do the production. Then we get paid on the production after adjustments if we're in network. And then we uh, get our collections or our revenue before we uh, have the overhead deducted out of it. So the sad part is we pay expenses, at least on the our variable expenses on what we produce. Other expenses that we pay, staff salaries, rent, we pay whether or not uh, we produce a dollar or not. So when we think about the profitability funnel, and, and I just really like this example, is that there's a lot of work that goes in to get that profit there um, at the end. And depending on what type of practice you have, and I know that uh, a lot of overhead items have gone up um, in the last couple of years. But in general, 35%, um, let's just go with that number, should be uh, the minimum amount of profit that we have at the end of the day in the practice, all right? And that I would say that would go to um, the business owner, all right? The more we can expand that revenue piece, also work to decrease the overhead, but get paid. Remember when we talked about the money tree, I'm going to go back here. How much money are you waiting on? The less money that we're waiting on, that's a huge win. Because when we get down to this part, the overhead has already been paid. 
on what's in your accounts receivable. So this is where I would say, and this is how I actually found out about eAssist years ago when I was a business coach, that maybe you need a better process or maybe it's time to outsource your accounts receivable to a trusted partner. So first let's talk about a better process. The collecting the money part, you know, which starts with insurance verification, being sure that patients understand what the full fee is, not only what we're saying their estimated portion is, that we're collecting their copay or their anticipated portion at the time of service or before the time of service, or we're using a deferred payment plan, right? So there are definite systems that we want to have in place in the office for sure. Being sure that our clinical documentation is up to snuff. Um, the other is maybe we either A, don't have our set ourselves set up for success time-wise. So if you have individuals in the office that are working the AR and you feel like they're effective, yet they simply don't have time, let's get them somewhere in the office where they can have some focused and dedicated time to be able to work on that. If you don't have individuals that are highly trained or maybe maybe they're brand new or Maybe you can't find them to work uh, your AR. It could be, that could be a great thing that you could outsource, like a, a, a great back office function to outsource. And, and we'll have an um, opportunity at the end if you guys have any questions about that. So it could be a practice management process uh, that needs to be tweaked, uh, or maybe you're looking for better systems in-house uh, to be able to handle uh, the AR in-house, which could be blocking time right, or having those internal team members trained, or if you can't find them, uh, then look for a trusted partner to be able to help you with that. Another area where you can find things for a fourth quarter push could be in your coding uh, in the dental office. And so this is something, I don't want to say that you couldn't DIY it. I mean, you could definitely do a review uh, internally of your, you would run the production summary by procedure to look at, okay, in our office, are we, you know, how many times are we billing for uh, 4355, which is a gross debridement. If we're not familiar with the coding changes, we may think, hey, we would hardly ever use that code. Well, the codes change every year. So um, not only looking at the codes that you're using, but also looking at the codes that you're not utilizing. And um, on our practice booster team, which they have a revenue enhancement product, most practices they find are leaving about $100,000 per year uh, in revenue on the table due to outdated coding and ineffective coding practices. So um, this is not necessarily a fourth quarter push, this one item that I'm going to mention, but it is something to prepare for for Q1 is that there is a new ADA claim form that's coming out. Um, and so you'll want to be sure that you're updating your practice management software to have the uh, the most current claim form. So um, if you're not, if you don't have someone in the office that's super on top of the codes or don't have an outsourced or uh, outside partner to work with on this, a revenue enhancement strategy can be great for you. Um, even when there are PPOs involved, um, significant impact. And some will say, well, we don't participate with PPOs. It actually has an even greater impact um, if you are not subject to contracted fees. So uh, definitely look at those coding strategies. You would have some time for sure um, if that was something that you had done in the next few weeks to experience not only some Q4 impact from that, but also a great start to your next year as well. And that goes hand in hand with um, hopefully most practices are looking at and raising their fees uh, on a regular basis. So we want to be sure that we're uh, charging a fair fee, uh, but also a, a competent fee for our area. And also that we're billing out the full fee on our claim form. And in my opinion, putting that fee schedule fee on the ledger, there's a, a way to do that in your software. But even if you have a contracted plan, they can't pay you more than what you're putting on the claim form. So be sure that you're doing that. And then the other would be uh, to negotiate fees. And this has changed uh, significantly um, over the last decade or more in that some of the PPO plans don't necessarily negotiate. 
um, or they may tell you that they don't. Yet the umbrella networks that many of you, I'm sure, have found yourselves in or you you go to do a practice transition and and you're filling out, well, what insurances do you participate with? And there's so many and so many where you're bundled up under another one. It just can get super messy. So um, another way here um, at the end of the year, if you've not already done it this year, would be to go ahead and look at uh, getting a, a fee schedule evaluation, which is also something that you can get done uh, with Practice Booster. And then also looking at, um, and we have an option um, coming up in a moment, if that is something you want more information on, uh, to negotiate fees with PPO management. So I want to share something with you before we go to Q&A. Um, for coming today, we do have a free ebook for you. Um, we began, uh, let's see, in the midsummer, uh, myself and Dr. Jim DeMarino with Practice Booster and Scott Hironaka with Unitas put together a program called It's Time to Give Yourself a Raise. And in that, we talk about the three C's of revenue cycle management, contracting, the PPO contracts, coding, dental coding, and collecting. Uh, free ebook for you that covers a lot of the content that we cover in that program. Um, if you would like to scan that, um, I'll go ahead and leave that up for a moment. Um, so we we definitely want to thank you for joining us. I'm going to open it up here for Q&A in just a moment um, and give you a moment there. I saw that we looked like we had a couple of questions coming up here. I'm going to go ahead and hop on over um, to this slide. Um and as I'm answering questions, if you would like to schedule a consultation or learn more about ESS services, if getting some of the back office functions off of your plate, which could be dental billing, dental accounting, the PPO negotiations, uh, having someone do a review uh, of uh, your production by code and giving you some insights on how to add more uh, money to your bottom line without even seeing another patient. Um, that would be awesome. So we've got a little poll uh, up here that I'll leave up for a moment and um, then we're happy to answer questions. So, you know, if you'd like to have someone reach out to you, um, just a simple yes or no. Um, you can also, it's no impact on whether or not you get the ebook. That's our gift to you. We're very, very excited about that. It took us quite a few months uh, to get that whole message put together and, and outline that and that's one of our missions in bringing peace of mind is being sure that you're being appropriately reimbursed for all of the work that you do. So um, we can go ahead and take the poll down if you want. Uh, Melanie, thank you for all you're doing behind the scenes there. And I'll go ahead and um, open up my chat window here so I can see what questions may have come in. And I'm going to go back to the ebook slide in case someone did not get an opportunity to uh, to scan that. Look, looks like we, okay, yes, yeah, someone was asking if they can get a copy of the recording. Um, absolutely, so because you registered, uh, once the recording is done and, and dusted off and has a little ribbon tied around it, um, we'll be getting that out to all of you um, who were here, so. Um, I would love to answer any questions that, that you may have. Um, happy to help with uh, any anything that resonated with you today that you're curious. Maybe you've tried it before and had some difficulty getting it implemented. Looks like we may have a shy group here today and that's totally okay. Um, so, you know, let us hear from you uh, what you enjoyed the most. Uh, from this session. We're super excited that you joined us and we can't wait to hear your stories uh, about how you have applied some of the things that you've learned, um, you know, in order to uh, to help you get to the next level. So, okay. Someone says our office already uses your services, but we need someone to take a look at our codes and see if they need updating. Um, that is fantastic. So uh, what we can do is we can um, connect you with uh, with someone at Practice Booster, Dr. Jim DeMarino's team, uh, to take a look at that. Melanie, I know you're, Melanie's behind, like the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain. Um, if you would be sure uh, that we grab their name so that we can be sure they get connected. And thank you. Um, we're happy to have you 
work with us. So, um, all right, we have a question. What is your measurable for AR amount or percentage? So um, that is a great question from Angel. And what I would say is both. Um, so the first is um, for every um, for every dollar that you produce, you should have a one-to-one -one ratio or no greater than that in your accounts receivable. So um, Angel, I like easy math. Um, and if you're producing a hundred thousand dollars in production every month, then you're in collectible production. So we'll say after adjustments, then your AR should be no greater than a hundred thousand, right? So a one to one ratio. And then the other measurable for AR, um, and, and I'll back this up a little bit is that your, your dollars that you collect on a daily basis, right? But if you roll it out over a month or a quarter, um, the dollars that you're collecting in the office from the patients should be at least 35% of what the production is. So again, we'll just kind of try to make this easy. If we produced $10,000 in that production today, we should have collected over the counter at the time of service at least 3,500, right? So so we know that 35% um, to 45%, right? If we're giving a range, we should get that day. So the rest of that in the AR ranges, um, and I'll work backwards, you're over 90, especially your over 90 insurance should be at zero or near zero. Um, and then in your um, 60 to 90 and 30 to 60 should be really no more than about, um, you know, 12%, which would leave that zero to 30 for the rest of that amount. So I realize that's just kind of a high level um, overview, but that's a great question. Um, and usually uh, when you're looking to make improvements with that, I would not only look at the back end of it, but also I would start tracking every single day, um, not only the dollar amount that came in, but also the percentage of production that came in every day, time of service, because a lot of offices are simply not getting the appropriate amount up front. Um, can I get a copy of this presentation? Absolutely, bear with us because um, that will be something that we'll manually send out. I'll get the tweaked slides over to um, over to Melanie, and then we can get that sent out to everyone that registered. So thank you so much for asking. Um, all right, so Abir, uh, yes, we do have regular sessions. That's a great question. We're new to eAssist. Welcome to eAssist. We not only have sessions like this, we also have some client-only sessions. Uh, that are lunch and learns um, that are a little bit shorter that we do every month. So you'll see those uh, in the client newsletter. So thank you for being uh, part of the uh, ESS family. And we hope that you found this useful. Um, but okay, because we use your services, does the team know to check codes for billing to check for increases? So the actual revenue enhancement that I'm speaking about is a separate service that the Practice Booster team, which is part of the family of brands, provides. Um, our ES sisters do have all of the latest materials where they could look to see if you were using, uh, you know, like deleted codes or maybe if there were some newer codes that you weren't using. But as far as the overall evaluation and the sequencing, um, many of you probably are familiar with Dr. Charles Blair, who was the founder of Practice Booster and a member of our team. Sadly, he passed away last week, but this is a, um, a separate service that you could have done once a year um, if you wanted to. And there are some discounts available um, if you let them know that you're a customer of eAssist. So um, hopefully that's helpful. All right. You're welcome, Angel. Um, okay. Well, I'm, I'm in all seriousness, I can't wait to hear about some of the uh, pearls that you heard about today, even if they were things you already knew, but just because of the busyness um, of things in the practice, let us hear from you on some of these items that you've implemented. Um, if you haven't already scanned that code to get the Give Yourself a Raise book, that is a great, you know, especially if you're going to sit down and look at an annual plan for next year, um, there can be some things in there that you may want to implement or put on your roadmap for next year as well. So. Um, it was a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, thank you for your trust. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.